Hello and welcome to a very special video. I am actually really excited to talk about this. I am the US Agent Mediocrity 4 and this is a solo podcast style video completely unscripted. I just watched the finale of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier and uh oh, it was really it really stuck the landing is what it did. Uh, I don't think it's as solid as WandaVision. I think that's going to be a question on a lot of people's mind like how does it compare to WandaVision? They're very very different shows. I don't think they warrant comparison, but they are the two Marvel series that are on Disney Plus now and so they kind of open up for that comparison even though it's not warranted really. Uh, I had issues with this series uh particularly one character in the series but we'll get to characters later i want to start off by saying that this will have spoilers uh obviously this is a full discussion on the entirety of the series i'm not going to get so much in the plot because i'm going to assume that you've seen it and there's not a whole lot to dissect about the plot it's very theme heavy it's very politically charged it's very character-centric, and that's the stuff that interests me more. And that's the stuff I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to assume you've all seen it. You don't need a plot beat by plot beat breakdown from me. There's plenty of other places you can go if you need a refresher. Uh, and this will also be spoilers for uh, the mainline comics, the 616 comic book universe, and a little bit of Ultimates probably sprinkled in there as well. Just because uh, uh, my main concern going into the series was my opinion on the comics. Uh, and I think that is where I should start. Uh, my experience with the comics is uh, I've always been a Captain America fan. He's always been one of my favorite superheroes. He's one of the few... Marvel characters whose comics I actually owned growing up. Uh, I didn't have a lot. I never, I was never really a comic book collector. Most of my comic book knowledge comes from like Wikipedia and this uh, year by year visual chronicle of Marvel comics that I have on my bookshelf. Uh, but I was always a big fan of Captain America. I always liked his costume. I always liked his attitude, the the whole, like, uh, I could do this all day thing. And I've always liked using Captain America to kind of chart out where Marvel's headspace is at as far as it relates to culture. Because unlike Spider-Man or the X, uh, the X-Men, maybe not so much, uh, but unlike Spider-Man, certainly uh, Thor, Wolverine, the Hulk... Captain America is very politically charged. He, he, he has America in his name. He's going to be inherently political. Funny because in the 50s, he wasn't very political. Or I should say in the 60s, it wasn't very political. The 50s were really weird about Captain America. But in the 60s and 70s, Captain America was not as political as you would think, given the time. The, the character who was actually really political at the time was Iron Man. Uh, Iron Man was the one who kept on fighting communist super robots and uh, magical Vietnamese wizards. I know Mandarin's not actually Vietnamese, but he was a stand-in for the Viet Cong. I'm just saying the, the comparison is there. Most of my bread and butter, as far as Marvel goes, is late 90s, early 2000s. This was when we got Dead Men Running, which is my favorite Captain America story. The Winter Soldier, obviously, that's probably the most famous. A lot of Avenger stuff, like uh, Kang Dynasty, I remember having as a kid. Uh, I think it was called the Kang Dynasty. It was one of the Avengers arcs with Kang the Conqueror. Uh, and I've always kind of kept my ear to the ground with Captain America. I haven't collected or, like, bought a Captain America book in, like, 15 years now. I, I think Civil War was the last one that I really got into. And even that, I, I, I had my problems with the Civil War comics that I'm not going to get into here. But I've always kept my ear to the ground. I've always, you know, been aware of the discourse surrounding the character. I did not mind when Sam Wilson took up the mantle, legacy characters. Th that stuff always happens. I don't think Sam Wilson was really right for it. Uh, my main issue with Sam Wilson as Captain America, conceptually speaking, not as far as the execution goes, but just the concept of him as Captain America, is the wingsuit-shield combo, like, one or the other it really it always looked goofy when he would have the shield and the wingsuit at the same time especially in like uh the more modern take where his wings are cybernetic like actually cybernetic i know they were always supposed to be like technology but uh back in the day they they looked like actual like feathery wings and not mechanical wings 
Uh, and so the mechanical wings and the shield always just looked goofy to me. And then it ended up having a lot of the same problems that modern Marvel has with the speech bubbles that take up 80% of the page, these really long communist propaganda diatribes that just... Ugh, no, no. Modern Marvel is not good. And uh, I don't think Captain America suffers the worst for it. Uh, I'd say... Mark Wade's Daredevil run, Captain Marvel, maybe some of the X-Men comics from the last few years, that they suffer for way worse than Captain America. Though a ton of he coats taking over, I don't know. All I know is that he turned Red Skull and Jordan Peterson, which is just really stupid. But that's my experience with the comics. Uh, my problem with modern Marvel as far as Steve Rogers is concerned, not Captain America as a mantle piece, is that they tend to give him a lot of white guilt that he doesn't deserve. Like, they use his presence as a symbol within the Avengers to, like, put all the sins of America on his shoulders. Like, no, that's never been what Captain America is about. Every time Captain America got really political, it was to unite people. Like, a Secret Empire, the original Secret Empire, which is one of the finest comic book runs ever made. It's actually... What inspired Captain America the Winter Soldier movie more than the Winter Soldier comic did. It's the whole, you know, the government with the gun to the world's head and those themes and Captain America coming on the side of liberty and freedom and giving up his mantle as Captain America in order to fight the government. All of that was a response to Watergate and all of that was a response to how disappointing Watergate was. Like, it's hard to look back because it's it's been so long since Watergate and all we know is like, oh, Nixon bad, Watergate. It's hard to remember that Nixon was actually a really good president up to that point. Like, he won in a massive electoral landslide in, uh, I think it was 1972. Uh, he had a lot of support across the aisle. Republicans and Democrats both loved Nixon and he was very effective. He did a lot of good stuff and then he fucked up. And Secret Empire was, it was almost like this coping mechanism that Marvel made to unite the people who never really liked Nixon, you know, the people who didn't vote for Nixon in 72, with the people who did in a, as, as a means to hold Nixon and his administration culturally accountable. Uh, of course, this wasn't like an actual condemnation. Nixon has never, I don't think he's ever actually name dropped in the book, but we all know what Secret Empire was all about. But yeah, it was a way to unify conservatives and liberals on the side of liberty, freedom, and not breaking into property in order to, you know, steal elections, uh, <laughs> which is what Watergate was all about. So with that said, I've always this is where the Ultimates comes in, because the Ultimates were more to blame for this, where they made Captain America an actual product of the 1940s, which ignores the fact that the Civil Rights Movement was already a thing by the 1940s in some way. You know, you had Jackie Robinson around at that time. You had, uh, you know, Rosa Parks was alive by that point. Martin Luther King Jr. was alive by that point. Like, they weren't super active or well-known, but they existed, no, the civil rights movement didn't start in 1960 and end in 1968. The civil rights movement was hundreds of years in the making, really. You, you could go all the way back to Alexander Hamilton writing all his essays against slavery and Thomas Jefferson fighting to stop the slave trade in Virginia, hypocrite as he was, he still wrote it. You know, that building into the abolition movement, building into... Uh, the Whigs' ineffectual attempts to stop the spread of slavery, which then caused the Civil War. And then you have Lincoln, that uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, all those amendments, the work of Frederick Douglass. Like, th it was a maelstrom. And, it's, and it continues to this day. Like, I'm not the biggest supporter of Black Lives Matter, but I am a supporter of Black Lives Matter as a concept, as an idea, as, yes... Black people are disproportionately punished by police. There's a lot of police profiling that gets abused, and I'm not going to get super into it, but it is a thing. But it's important to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. 
you know, the whole system isn't corrupt. It is just a few bad apples. Although, depending on who you ask, it could be you know, four or five bad apples or four or five hundred bad apples. Either way, it's it's people that are the problem, not, you know, the actual structures themselves. And that's one of the things I like about where this show, you know, falls with Sam Wilson taking the mantle of Captain America. But I'll get to that when I get to the Falcon himself. Now that I've talked about my political leanings a little bit and, and the comics, uh, the MCU, I think, has been the perfect quintessential version of Captain America. Whatever your opinion on Chris Evans as an actor or as a human, I know he could be kind of a dick on Twitter, he is Steve Rogers. There will never be another Steve Rogers like him. He has joined the echelon of, like, Christopher Reeve's Superman and Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man as just lightning in a bottle. They got it perfect the first time. There's no way to improve it. Everything else is going to feel tacked on. Every other version of Steve Rogers is going to feel tacked on in the future because we got the best version that we could possibly get. Like, I could not, with a whole team of Captain America fanboys create a better version of this character than the MCU got us. You know, I love Captain America the First Avenger. It's probably my favorite Phase 1 movie. Uh, Well, actually, The Avengers is still technically Phase 1. So that's my favorite. And then Captain America the First Avenger, then Iron Man. And Iron Man, I know, is technically a better movie than the first Captain America, but... I don't care about Iron Man as much, not even in the MCU, which is, again, one of the better versions of the character, and uh, Robert Downey Jr. is just as quintessentially Tony Stark as Chris Evans is quintessentially Captain America. Uh, and this perfection was just made even more perfect with Captain America the Winter Soldier, which really asked some really big questions and took some really much-needed cathartic pot shots at the Patriot Act, and how just awful that was. And that was a Republican thing, by the way. You know, people who know me on Twitter know that I tend to vote for Republican. No, the, that's not necessarily true. Because within my lifetime, the worst thing that has ever happened that has been perpetuated by the U.S. government was supported by Democrats, yes, and that's important to note, too. It was a very bipartisan effort, the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act is a terrible infringement on every single civil liberty you could possibly enjoy. And it has been used for horrible, horrible things by Bush, by Obama, by Trump. And it's currently being used for terrible things by Biden, by the way. You know, all four people who have been president since the Patriot Act are very guilty of utilizing the Patriot Act or the, the spirit of the Patriot Act to spy on people, more or less. Like, that's that violates the Fourth Amendment. Uh, Captain America Winter Soldier, it was just this really cathartic gut punch where, no, we gotta burn that whole system down. Like, Nick Fury is like, oh no, it's just Hydra that is hijacking our metaphor for the Patriot Act to Steve Rogers like, I don't care whose finger is on the trigger, the gun shouldn't exist. These helicarriers should have never been an idea. What was S.H.I.E.L.D. gonna do with those? Like, Hydra aside, yes, it was Hydra that was gonna hijack them to kill people like Doctor Strange and Tony Stark and Steve Rogers. But what was S.H.I.E.L.D. gonna do with it? Is it any better to keep it in Nick Fury's hands? The master spy? Like, I like Nick Fury, and I love him in that movie, and I love how that juxtaposes with Steve Rogers' viewpoint, but I am with Steve Rogers on that full stop, and he is completely uncompromised in that movie, and it's just a brilliant, brilliant movie. That's not even getting into the stuff with the Winter Soldier and how that just, oh, it's so good. It's one of the best Marvel movies for a reason. Uh, and the, all, a lot of those themes continue with Civil War. Civil War was all about, like, who watches the Watchmen? Who who avenges for the Avengers? You know, Baron Zemo comes in as this person who lost his family because of what happens in the Age of Ultron, and he decides to tear the Avengers apart, and they 
get torn apart because of this different view of accountability. Steve Rogers believes in personal accountability, holding yourself and your friends accountable for their action. Tony Stark believes that there needs to be a higher authority than the Avengers to hold them accountable, and that's where the clash starts. And that does lead into Infinity War and Endgame, which doesn't do as much with Captain America as I would have maybe liked as a big Captain America fanboy, but it's all kind of left by the wayside here, honestly, now that I'm thinking about it. There are a lot of really big questions about Captain America, his history as both a character, as a symbol, you know, as an icon, as an idea, as a mantelpiece. It's not the same kind of questions that were in Winter Soldier or Civil War. And I, I do like that because Sam Wilson is not Steve Rogers. Neither is John Walker, neither is Carly Morgenthau, neither is Bucky Barnes. The only Steve Rogers is Steve Rogers. The only Sam Wilson is Sam Wilson. The only John Walker is John Walker. Like, I like that aspect of this series. This is a good of time as any to actually start talking about that series. I'm going to start with the production values. Uh, this is a very good looking show. I think it is the least impressive of the three Disney Plus shows that I have seen. The other two being Mandalorian and WandaVision. Uh, WandaVision was just visually striking. And did a lot to, like, really adhere to its own idea of Wanda creating a sitcom with her powers. You know, using very, uh, of-the-era special effects, especially in those earlier episodes. Uh, and Mandalorian just looks worthy of the big screen. This looks... Falcon and the Winter Soldier, it looks like a really high-budget TV show. It's about on par with your average Game of Thrones or Walking Dead episode. Uh, there's a lot of moments where it really kicks a lot of ass. Like this opening scene in the first episode where Falcon is fighting uh, Batroc the Leaper, is his name in the comics, uh, where he fights Batroc the Leaper. He's the French guy from Winter Soldier who Steve Rogers did the flip kick against and he's in this movie that's a I thought that was a really nice cameo then he comes back at the end and it's kind of this reveal with him working with the power broker to get close to Carly and I I dug all that I thought it was really silly that of all the like seed list Captain America villains they chose Batrock to be the one that that is in Captain America the Winter Soldier's opening scene and then that's the character that they decided to uh, make this this kind of like a final, not final boss because he's not the last person Sam fights in the episode, but he is there in the finale and that just, it, it amuses me. Batroc is a lot of fun in this. For every scene that kicks ass like that, there's a scene that it looks like it's taken from Taken. Particularly any scene where... Carly fights without her mask because when she has the mask they're obviously using a stunt double and so they're able to do a lot more but when she's fighting without the mask eh, it looks really sloppy and there's other scenes that look really sloppy in the action department as well and I can't I, I could not figure out why maybe if I go back and watch those episodes and watch the credit list I can kind of piece together some kind of correlation with why some episodes look good and some episodes look bad. As it stands, it's really inconsistent with uh, the camera work and the choreography and stuff. And then there's some scenes that I think it was done on purpose. Like, uh, there's this scene where they're they're in uh, Madripoor and Sharon Carter kicks some ass. And that is ju it's just this really visceral, raw, violent action sequence and it uses a lot of shaky cam, a lot of close-ups, and it just, it makes it, it works, is what I'm saying. It worked for that scene. For Sam and Bucky versus John Walker, not so much. Getting into kind of the meat of, of the series now. Theme-wise, the biggest theme here is Captain America. Symbol and to a lesser extent, character. We got plenty of his character in his own trilogy of movies, as well as the Avengers movies. So we don't really need to talk about that. But him as a symbol is really... It's teased a lot in his own trilogy, not so much in the Avengers movies. 
uh, the first movie, it really shows uh, his comic book history as propaganda. Builds kind of this meta narrative there where, you know, Captain America started off as war propaganda. You know, he punched Hitler in the jaw, even though he never actually punches Hitler in the comics. Not even that issue. That was just to sell more comics so that they could help fund World War II. And in... You know, the 50s, again, they kind of went really weird with them, and then they retconned, a, they retconned, they pretty much at one point retconned all of 50s Captain America as not having happened and having been someone else wearing the Captain America costume. That's when they introduced the him actually having been frozen in uh, World War II, you know, subplot, you know, and then he gets thought out in the 60s and joins the Avengers, and, you know, he's he's the guy who inspires other heroes, and we see him as this inspirational figure in Winter Soldier, even though he's he's seemingly unaware of the impact he's having on people like Sharon Carter and Sam and Bucky. But it, it is there. Uh, and then in Civil War, it becomes much more apparent uh, with, you know, again, Sharon Carter and uh, Ant-Man, uh, especially Ant-Man in that movie and how he's like, you know, all this this gung-ho, yeah, I'm only here because Captain America asked, and it kind of leaves the question linger for the audience to pick up on because it's never properly addressed in that movie that Captain America, by his name and reputation, calls these people to lay down their lives for his causes. And that's something he never had to come to grips with. And... That's why I really wish he would have made a cameo here. A cameo to kind of see, like, the fact that, you know, John Walker, Sam, Bucky, they're all in some way inspired by him and are taking it in different directions. And I would also wonder what this version of Steve Rogers would think of Isaiah Bradley. And I'll get to that when I get to, uh, you know, that subplot. But basically... Sam thinks that Steve Rogers is the only Captain America and the government disagrees. That's why they kind of con him out of getting the shield. They give it to John Walker, who's this like golden boy, American soldier. I'd have actually kind of imagined that they wouldn't have minded if Sam Wilson took the mantle of Captain America right away, but he didn't want to. They thought the world needed Captain America as a symbol. And so they gave it to John Walker. But that's kind of my conjecture. I don't know if the writers would agree with that interpretation that was certainly my thought uh, especially at the end with how welcoming they are of him as captain america or that you know at least the majority of the people we see including john walker i have a lot to say about john walker he's probably the best part of the he, he's the first or second best thing in the show but zemo says something in, in episode three which is probably my favorite episode where he says something along the lines of, because of America's place at the top of the pedestal of the world, the American super soldier is an inherently dangerous thing. Because we forget that these are people, and that people have flaws. Uh, and it harkens back to something Zemo says in Civil War when he first encounters Captain America and sees how much of a stubborn dick Steve Rogers can be. He's like, Ah, uh, there's a little green in the blue of your eyes. How reassuring to find a flaw. He says something along those lines. We see that happen to an even greater extreme with, with John Walker later in the show. And we see that a little bit with, with Sam Wilson and how he's much more compromising. Like, again, he's not Steve Rogers. Steve Rogers would not talk about Carly's feelings. He would not stand to be lectured by Isaiah Bradley. He would speak his mind and he'd hold to it no matter what Isaiah Bradley or John Walker or Carly Morgenthau say. That's who Steve Rogers is. It can be a flaw. It's a great aspect of his character because it can be used to shut people like Thanos or Red Skull or Kang the Conqueror up, but it can be a flaw because you know, it could also drive Tony away and drive the Avengers apart and drive the world apart if he picks a certain side in a conflict. Like, that's, it's such a great, stubbornness is such a great character trait because 
of how much it lends itself to being used for good and bad. It's it's done both wondrously throughout some excellent Captain America comics. Again, Secret Empire probably being the the standout, and I I think Secret Empire might have been what introduced that aspect of Captain America because, again, I don't have this encyclopedic knowledge of the comics. But I feel like Secret Empire was the first one to actually, like, do anything remotely like that with Steve Rogers. Uh, and, of course, because Secret Empire was such a resounding success, there's been a dozen other iterations, like uh, Captain America No More, which was uh, where John Walker was introduced as a U.S. agent, and uh, the rehash trash fire of Secret Empire that was used, uh, that, that was a couple years ago with the Hell, you know, the, Captain America is an agent of Hydra because Red Skull used the cosmic cube to wish that Captain America was on a side and then they had to bring in a parallel world version of Steve Rogers to beat up that version of Steve Rogers. But then he's like, oh no, because of this magical wishing rock that has been part of Marvel's lore for a very long time, I can't be Captain America I'm too, you know, corruptible. Sam, you're compromising as way less corruptible than me. <laughs> so stupid. Secret. The, the the more recent Secret Empire is so awful and is such a just shit show for Steve. Even though I really like Sam in it, it, it kind of sucks because I do actually like what that arc did with Sam and and you know. I really felt like he he actually did earn the shield in that arc, but the way they treated Steve Rogers was so shameful that it that it doesn't matter. Now that I've I've waxed poetic about you know Captain America's stubbornness and his symbology and stuff, let's actually talk about the characters. I'm gonna do Falcon last. I'm gonna do Winter Soldier second to last. They're the title characters. They should have the most going on. I'm going to start with John Walker. So John Walker in the comics is more or less pseudo-fascist Captain America. He is Captain America if Captain America actually did represent the American government rather than the American ideals. Uh, He is, in this, portrayed by Wyatt Russell, who I think does a fantastic job, by the way. Uh, And here he kind of starts off as like a what-if Steve Rogers was the kind of person who would have compromised and signed the Accords. Or would have been for the Accords to begin with, rather. John Walker is pretty stubborn in this as well. Uh, he He does share that in common with Steve. And I really like that, especially with how much Captain America Civil War impacts this story, and how much of the story kind of relies on aspects of Captain America Civil War having happened and people remembering it happened. Uh, This is the perfect version of what the MCU could do with John Walker at first. I don't like how he is treated by Sam and Bucky right out the gate. Uh, I get that Sam would feel betrayed that the S.H.I.E.L.D. isn't in a museum and that they picked a different Captain America other than him. But he didn't want it anyway. So, why the fuck should he care about that? Uh, I get, I I more understand where Bucky is coming from, because Bucky, he was there in the 1940s. He saw Steve Rogers go from scrawny little dweeb to Captain America to Captain America. And it's, it still doesn't sit well with me, thinking of those first few episodes and how poorly he is treated like John Walker he just wants to be the best Captain America he can be he wants to do right by the U.S. government he wants to do right by his girl he wants to do right by his uh best friend Lamar who is pretty good in this as well uh they're both they're all really good John Walker his girlfriend whose name escapes me and Lamar who plays uh Lamar is the name (laughs) sorry Battlestar is his superhero name and he's from the comics too he was Again, just like in in this, uh, Battlestar was like John Walker's black sidekick. He was the Falcon to his Captain America. And which raises an interesting question of what would Steve had done had someone killed Sam. 
Interesting food for thought. I'm going to just leave for you. I'm not even going to give my own thoughts on that. But he really does just want to live up to these really impossibly high expectations of being this morally upright character and being the symbol of America and being the symbol of peace and justice and having to kick ass. Like, that's a tall order. Especially when he's fighting a, a group of super soldiers and he's not a super soldier. He's just a pretty good, like, army ranger, I think is what he was, or a paratrooper, maybe. Like, he, he's just a really good soldier. He's not a superhuman like uh, Captain America or, like, uh, the Winter Soldier. And we see him just get the shit kicked out of him left and right by the Flag Smashers and then by... Uh, the Wakandans who are in this for reasons that make perfect sense and that I kind of like, but I don't like them. I don't like these these Wakanda characters that show up. I especially don't like that this whole like uh the, the you know we go wherever we feel we are needed. Like that's exactly what Captain America as John Walker, like, that that's, that's something John Walker would say. We're supposed to just, like, hate John Walker and love these Wakandan guards because they're black women, I guess? They were dicks, and they totally let Zemo escape. Like, they did not need to fight John Walker in that instance. And kicking his ass is what convinced John Walker that he needed the Super Soldier Serum. And the Super Soldier Serum, as is it is in here, it just makes you more of who you are. So all of this pent-up frustration and anger at inadequacy. John Walker, in the first several episodes, feels inadequate. He doesn't feel like he is worthy of being Captain America. And even when he gets the Super Soldier Serum, which levels the playing field against the Flag Smashers... He is unable to save his best friend, and he loses his mind over that. But he doesn't actually lose his mind. They actually stuck the landing. That's why I'm really excited to talk about this, because that last episode where he makes the, the trash can shield and is fighting the Flag Smashers side by side with Falcon and with Winter Soldier and just being a good person, like, he gets this choice towards the end where he can keep fighting Carly Morgenthau and get his revenge and kill the most annoying character in the entire series, something I wouldn't personally fault him for, or he could save this van full of hostages. He chooses the van. Like, there's a couple moments where he does live up to the Captain America name, and it's a shame that the show outside of those few moments, treats him so terribly, honestly. And like I mentioned before, in the end, he's not angry at Sam for taking the mantle of Captain America. He just wants to do right. You know, he he might not, you know, be the same kind of morally upright person that Steve Rogers was, but he's still just doing his best. And he's really excited to be U.S. agent. Like, it's not this... They took the Captain America mantle away from me, so now I'm gonna be bad Captain America. Like, no, he's still like, oh my god, I'm just glad to be working. <laughs> you know, he's just glad to be here. It's so wholesome, actually. I I never thought they would, in 2021, make the most wholesome version of John Walker that's ever existed. Because John Walker in the comics, again, like he's very jingoistic. He's very pseudo-fascist. He's very right wing right-wing extremist and at various points he is very bitter towards steve rogers for being captain america and continuing to be captain america after you know retiring several different times captain america no more great story not my favorite captain america uh series and i really thought they would make him more extreme but it, it makes sense it makes sense that john walker is supposed to be the U.S. government. He is the U.S. agent at the end of the day, and he always was. He just gets that mantle at the end of this series. It makes sense that someone who embodies 
the American government circa 2021 would be a lot more open and progressive than someone who does the same circa 1980. Now, he has a mixed-race girlfriend. Uh, he genuinely cares about Lamar. Like, he, th there's the scene in, uh, I think it's episode 5, where he's he visits Lamar's family and he just, like, starts crying and it's just a really heart-wrenching scene that, like, they love him and he loves them and, you know, Lamar had nothing but, like, admiration for John and John had nothing but love for Lamar and it's just, it's, again, like, it really makes me wonder what Steve would have done had someone killed Sam. Or if someone would have killed Bucky uh, somewhere down the line. But he is, or at least I, I, this is where I thought they were going with it after episode one. Where they have him on one end of the spectrum. And then they have Flag Smasher on the other end of the spectrum. And Sam has to fall somewhere in the middle. It's not really where they went with that. Uh, and I think Carly Morgenthau is the worst part of the series. She plays the leader of the Flag Smashers. Plural. Flag Smasher Singular in the comics was an anarcho-communist bad guy named Carl Morgenthau. Very much same motivation as, as Carly in this. And, you know, no borders, one world, one people, uh, citizens of the planet unite kind of deal. Like, that kind of collectivist horseshit that I just have very low tolerance for. What annoyed me right out the gate with Carly is that... She gets revealed in, I think, episode two. The reveal that the Flag Smashers are, like, actually a bunch of kids. And not just not just kids, but kids led by a little girl. It reminded me a lot of Solo. Solo had this exact same plot twist where you had uh, the Raiders or the Ravagers or whatever they were called. The, the, the pirate group that killed Woody Harrelson's girlfriend... And stole all the, the fuel on the train. And, and you know, kind of caused the plot of the movie to have to happen. Which is a crime in and of itself. But, you know, at the end of that movie, they show back up. And the leader takes off their mask. And it's a little redhead girl. And that's supposed to be like, oh, no, see? It's not this big, tough, bad guy. It's this little girl. You're supposed to feel sorry for them. You know, ignore all their war crimes and all their murders and theft. You know, they're just, she's just a little girl. That plot twist by itself would be just stupid for the show. But the fact that they use the same actress. This is the same actress from Solo playing effectively the same character for the same narrative shorthand plot twist bullshit and that set me off right out the gate like that was where like uh this might end up being bad and sh don't get me wrong love the show it's solid everyone else works Carly Morgenthau does not work she is supposed to be the other side of the extreme from John Walker you know John Walker is very America first I have jurisdiction wherever I need to be Carly Morgenthau is one world one people collectivist one is, is authoritarian right, the other is anarcho-left. The reason Carly Morgenthau doesn't work is because she is selfish. The thing about collectivists, the thing that makes collectivist antagonists and collectivist protagonists work is that they cannot, cannot be selfish if you want them to work. Being selfish inherently makes them not collective. Carly Morgenthau is full of shit every time she talks about, you know, wanting what's best for the people. No, she wants what's best for her and people like her who had it rough before the snap, but had it better after half the planet was wiped out. Like, I'm glad the, the senator at the end, you know, he goes like, Sam, I, I see what you're saying here, but... What about the people that, that got snapped away and they show up five years later and see someone is living in their home? Should we just make them homeless? Like, th there is no easy answer here. And I'm glad Sam, as, again, like, going back to, to Captain America as this unifying principle, Sam doesn't offer any 
you know, solutions to this problem. He said, like, you got to figure something out. You have an opportunity here to make the world better. You know, you control the banks, you control the borders, you control the governments and the militaries. You can accommodate for both of these groups of people. You can accommodate for people who were snapped away while also accommodating for people who benefited from those people being snapped away. It also does not help Carly's case that she is a murderous psychopath who has absolutely no regard for anyone's life except her own. Like, she gets kind of teary-eyed when uh, John Walker kills her her one friend. Uh, but other than that, like, she has no empathy for the innocence that she is putting in harm's way. Like, not everyone who was snapped away was a bad guy. Like, th again, it was completely random. 50% of all life in the universe got snapped away. Rich, poor, white, black, it doesn't matter. No, 50% of everyone. And yet she, her her thought is, uh, is that they should have just stayed snapped. No, why didn't they just stay dead? She got all these free handouts because 50% of the homes were vacant, 50% of the cars were vacant, 50% of the jobs were open. Now that, that's what happens when a large portion of the population just disappears in a snap. And she is just really pissy and angry that these people came back and wanted the jobs that they earned back and wanted the homes that they built back and wanted the property that they bought back. Like, they, they earned it. They, they worked for that stuff that they got. And Carly wants to make them homeless and will murder as many people as she needs to to keep them that way. Completely lack of sympathy, completely selfish, and it does not work. And it is the worst part of the series. Like, they could have made her a lot less like Antifa and a lot more like the better aspects of Black Lives Matter. Again, not the biggest fan, but I do agree with the concept. Just to reiterate that. Antifa is the one I, I really have the problems with. Because they're anti-fascist in name only. Carly Morgenthau is only a collectivist in name only. You know, I was waiting for the moment where one of her Flag Smasher buddies just had enough of her bullshit and just snapped her neck. And we're like, she's not Flag Smasher, we are Flag Smasher. You know, the people here who actually do have their hearts in the right place about this. And aren't, you know, murdering thousands of innocent people to get what we want because we're being really pissy about, you know, people not wanting to be homeless with that rant aside, let's get into uh, Sharon Carter, who plays a lot larger role in this than I thought she would. And it's not the role I thought she would either. So, plot twist, she's the power broker. Everyone kind of saw that coming. I said, you know, weeks ago that, like, if she is not the power broker, she is the power broker's right-hand man. Uh, which would actually be a little more comic-friendly, because the power broker is a character in the comics. Uh, he's someone who, like, he works a lot with, like, the Tinker, uh, who was a guy who worked with Michael Keaton in Spider-Man Homecoming. Uh, you know, he sells a lot of power suits and chemicals and stuff to thugs to give them a, you know, a level playing field against the heroes. Like, that's kind of the guy he is. So, uh, Power Broker in the comics is also very much tied to John Walker, and the comics, he's the one who gave John Walker the super soldier serum eventually. And in a roundabout way, that's the case here with how, like, the Flag Smashers got the super soldier serum from the power broker. And then John Walker knocked out Zemo before he could break the last vial. And that's the vial that John Walker used to juice up. Like, so in a roundabout way, he is, but in the comics... Uh, John Walker and Lamar, they're, they're a lot more in bed with the power broker than they are in here. I don't think they ever find out that there is a power broker. Uh, unless Madam Hydra ends up being connected uh, to the power broker somehow, which wouldn't be outlandish because uh, we do get Madam Hydra in this, played by Julia Louis-Dreyfus, and... Yes, she is also going to be in the Black Widow movie. The Black Widow movie was supposed to come out last year. And so 
this reveal feels kind of weird and, and people have pointed this out that the reveal feels kind of weird because it feels like it was supposed to be a big reveal in black widow which was supposed to have already come out and that this was supposed to be like oh it's madame hydra from the black widow movie but it, it's it still works especially since black widow is supposed to be a like a prequel deal anyway or i'm not sure where it fits in with the timeline it it, it might fit in like between infinity war and in-game but other than that, like, I, I don't know how it would matter one way or the other. But that character, Madame Hydra, in the comics, uh, she is Agent 14 as well. Uh, within the S.H.I.E.L.D. like uh, strike teams. And Sharon Carter is Agent 13. Sharon Carter and uh, Madame Hydra, they, they always kind of like butted heads in the comics i'm not uh super familiar with them in the comics uh again i i read this on wikipedia but i do know that they were part of uh the agents of shield comic line that they both worked directly under nick fury and that they both fought over the affections of steve rogers at one point that's uh, so i know there's a lot of history there between sharon carter and madame hydra that they could that they could use um whenever uh second season of this comes out which i think is going to be called captain america and the winter soldier which i feel like they i feel like it should be called captain america and the white wolf but i'll get to that when i get to to bucky so i i do like her in this she's she's a badass in this and it seems kind of out of character for her but it has been a long time and she's been on the run for a long time so it's one of those things where it's just like eh, you know the time has passed. She's different now than she was in Captain America Civil War. So next, and this is uh, going to be another meaty part of this discussion, and that is Isaiah Bradley. I think in the comics, Isaiah Bradley is a good character. I do not like the way he was introduced. Uh, he was introduced in a Captain America story called Truth, which uh, it's it's from like 2003, I think. And it was one of the early progenitors of Marvel trying to white guilt trip Steve Rogers out of being Captain America. There were there's a string of writers between like 2002 and 2010 that did not like that Steve Rogers was a good person, and they tried to like retcon a bunch of stuff into his lore to make it seem like he was benefiting from racism and stuff like very modern marvel very modern leftist sensibilities uh clouding what should be a very unifying character and i know in the comics isaiah bradley never you know he never directly guilt trips captain america but his treatment by the u.s government throughout the 40s and 50s is one of the reasons why captain america ends up becoming kind of the, the person he becomes right before he gives the shield to Sam. He is a lot more bitter in this version than he is in the comics. And it works, I think, a lot better because of time. And time, time creates different contexts. Now, the story behind Truth, again, like, it, it's probably a good story on its own. And again, I like Isaiah Bradley as a character in the comics, I just don't like the effect he, he had on future Captain America comics. It was based on the real Tuskegee Airmen uh, trials, where the U.S. government, in all of its wisdom, decided to use the Tuskegee pilots, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, I can never... It's just, it's a weird word for me, uh, to test out drugs, and it had very devastating long-term effects and was completely and utterly inhumane it is one of the worst things the u.s government did in that period of time and isaiah bradley was a reference to those humanity crimes like the crimes against humanity that the u.s government perpetuated in world war ii and in the comics he you know he was captain america before steve rogers was he was just kind of a prototype or whatever and uh, to test the serum out. And it, it, it inadvertently it made uh, Dr. Erskine seem a lot more like a dick than he was in prior iterations. And again, like it kind of just guilt trips Steve Rogers into not liking the Captain America title. But that was almost 20 years ago. It is not 
viable for a World War II vet to still be kind of kicking around like that in, in 2020. So because 20 years have passed in real time since that comic came out, they had to move some stuff around with Isaiah Bradley's backstory in order to kind of compensate for that. And so instead of World War II, it is now the Korean War. And because it's the Korean War, that also allowed Isaiah Bradley to butt heads with the Winter Soldier, which is a really nice reveal, by the way. I wish we could see that. Like, get an actor to play young Isaiah Bradley and see how that fight would have went down. We just know that Isaiah Bradley kicked the Winter Soldier's ass, which is... Uh, I, I dig it. So he, w he was an attempt to recreate Captain America and... Because it was the 50s and 60s, that's a much more politically charged time than the 1940s as far as race relationships go. And so it makes a lot more sense that the U.S. government would do the things that they do to him. It doesn't make moral sense, obviously. It's still just a horrible thing to do to a person. But it makes sense within the MCU, especially since we know that Hydra was a thing by this point. Like, Hydra had already infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D. by this point. So, and and we know that because Isaiah Bradley, like, your people, you know, he, he points to Bucky and he's like, yeah, your people, they, they weren't the only ones. You know, they weren't done with me yet either. He, he says something along the lines like that. I like the way he is utilized here. And I think it is an, a, a massive improvement over how he is implemented in the comics. Mostly because Steve Rogers isn't here. You know, it, he's not guilt tripping Steve Rogers. He's trying to guilt Sam Wilson into not liking the Captain America mantle, even though Steve Rogers was his best friend. Uh, and I am so happy that the show agrees with me and that Sam agrees with me that Isaiah Bradley is a bitter old fucking loon. Thank you for your service, Mr. Bradley, but kind of go fuck yourself. No, that, that's kind of the end there. Like, uh, I, I love Sam's sister in this and she says something like, you're not gonna let Isaiah Bradley get in your head, are you? Like, you're not gonna let him, you know, make you forget that Steve Rogers wasn't around at that time, would not have stood for it had he known. Like, you're, don't let Isaiah Bradley make you hate Captain America just because he had a bad experience with it. And I think that, that that's a powerful statement for the fandom as well. For like, you know, going out there being a being a content creator, like don't, you know, make someone someone that likes something hate something just because you had a bad experience with that. I, I I think that is an important life lesson that can apply to all sorts of situations. And I like that Isaiah Bradley goes through this this little arc where he realizes that the world has changed. It's no longer the 1960s. America has moved the fuck on. Not to say like, oh, Isaiah, do you realize we, we had a black president now? But Isaiah, do you realize we had a black president by this point? We had it in the 60s. But, you know, we did in, from 2008 to 2016. We had, you know, a duly elected black man as president. I don't think the world cares if a black man has kept in America as a title. As some people will, there are, you can't legislate racism away. Racism is, it's kind of just this inherent human flaw. You know, we hate that, uh, there's a lot of people that just hate things that are different. That Those people will always exist. Ignore them. Like, Sam ignores them. Like, he says, like, I, I can feel their stares, I can feel their scowls. I'm Captain America, though. And I'm not going to let them drag me down. I'm not, I'm not going to let Carly Morgenthau drag me down. I ain't going to let the people who prefer John Walker drag me down. I'm not going to let Isaiah Bradley drag me down. I am a black man and I am Captain America and I'm going to be the best Captain America I can be. And I, I believe him when he says that. Now, let's talk a little bit about my favorite part of this series, Baron Zemo. I love that they gave him the purple sock mask. <laughs> They don't have him in it for long. I, I wish he was in it more. I, it's one of those things where, like, after it happened, I was like, okay, I, I want him to wear that anytime he gets in an action sequence, and then he, he doesn't get in another action sequence after that, really. Daniel Brühl, I always, th I always liked him as Zemo. Zemo in the comics is... I like him. There's a lot of cheesiness with him, though. Not just because of the purple sock mask and the, the fur coat. Uh, he's a ostensibly Captain America villain, but he's always been 
bigger than Captain America. He's always been kind of like the guy that Captain America needs help to fight. You know, he uh, there's a lot of comics where he's in control of Hydra. There's a lot of times where him and Red Skull are fighting over control over Hydra. There's times where uh, he gathers up a bunch of other supervillains to form the Masters of Evil. You know, people like Crimson Dynamo, the Abomination, Enchantress, Executioner. And there's times where he plays the hero as Citizen V, leader of the Thunderbolts, which I would love if his arc, quote unquote, here ends up leading to a Thunderbolt series with with him and like Justin. <laughs> Can you imagine like a Thunderbolts movie in this universe? Like you get him, Abomination, the Vulture. Uh, like I said, the Masters of Evil, like you get all these villains that have survived their Marvel movies and get them as like a superhero team. Like you get uh, Baron Zemo and Justin Hammer, <laughs> like Justin Hammer becomes this universe's version of Crimson Dynamo. That, oh man, that that would be awesome. I, I would I would love that so much. But in episode three, he's only in half the episodes. Like he's in, he he gets introduced in episode three. We get the prison break scene. We get a bunch of stuff with him in episode three. He kicks some ass in episode four. Uh, that that's the the um, Madripoor episode, and then he he disappears or, or not disappears, but he he says his farewell in episode five and goes to the raft. Uh, but he does get the last laugh by bombing the truck with the remaining flag smashers in it. Uh, thanks to his his butler guy. He has a butler, by the way. That was that was interesting. He is a baron, I guess. Even though they never really say anything about him being rich in Captain America: Civil War. But in episode three, especially, every single line he says is just a masterpiece. It's it's a masterpiece, James. Complete, comprehensive. Talking talking about uh, Marvin Gaye's Trigger Man soundtrack. Yeah, <laughs> Bucky's like I listened to it. I thought it was okay. Uh, I really like how he messes with, with Bucky's head. And I really like... He's so smart. And he is so charismatic. And Daniel Brühl is such a good actor in this. Like, it makes me glad that they don't have him in the purple sock mask very often. Because the purple sock mask would distract from the performance that Daniel Brühl is given. And he's given a lot to work with. Uh, for as few lines as he actually ends up having. And now that I've, I've kind of gushed about... Zemo, as I've done off and on kind of throughout this whole thing. Let's talk about the two leads. I think Bucky gets the short end of the stick. He's supposed to be a super soldier. He's supposed to be one of the best super soldiers. He's supposed to be someone who could beat Captain America on a good day. And he doesn't get to fight a whole lot. Like, he, he gets a lot of these action scenes, but he doesn't get to really impact them very often and his arc is supposed to be about righting the wrongs of the past that uh he did as the winter soldier uh this comes full circle at the end when he visits that that old uh, asian gentleman whose son he had killed as the winter soldier uh and he he has the book that says i finished the book i think for all intents and purposes at that moment the winter soldier is dead bucky bards obviously still alive but him as the winter soldier him as this like person clouded with these dark memories of all the horrible things he had done when he was under Hydra's control like that's gone like he he gets closure which is why I, I wish the Flag Smashers were maybe connected more to Hydra maybe that would have helped smooth things over and make him feel more important for this plot Sebastian Stan does such a phenomenal job he's probably the best performance here uh particularly the scene and I think it's I think it's uh, episode four. I think it's the beginning of episode four where it shows uh, him and the one Wakanda lady test out the the codes that turn him into a, a mindless killing machine and it doesn't work and you can... It's just such a beautiful scene. And Sebastian Stan knocks it out of the park. Sebastian Stan's a great actor. I just don't feel like they give him a lot to do outside of being uh, Sam Wilson's white sidekick for lack of a better term. Like, you know, they, they make him kind of flirt with Sam's sister. Uh, he does pull the, the the thing off the truck at the end uh, 
to, to save a bunch of people. He he saves people off and on throughout this whole thing. He, he gets to kick some ass off and on. But I never really felt like his character arc was connected to the plot at hand. Like, he, he had kind of his own thing going on in the first episode. Uh, he has his own opinions on Captain America as a symbol. His own opinions on John Walker, on the Flag Smashers, on Carly, and, and everything that's going on. But it's not really connected to the Winter Soldier as an idea. Like, the Winter Soldier as a concept is the the soldier who fights for the darkness of of you know, the powers that be, you know, Captain America is this beacon of light and hope and the symbol of patriotism and Winter Soldier is the, the cloak and dagger dark side of this same idea, you know, he's the one who was going around doing assassinations and bombings and stuff like that on behalf of Hydra, who were, you know, infested into a lot of different governments, including the American government. And uh, maybe maybe season two will bring in a villain who is connected with Hydra. Maybe that's why it's going to be called Captain America and the Winter Soldier. Although, again, I think this, as season two for this, should be called Captain America and the White Wolf. A uh, White Wolf is what the Wakandans called him. That's who he was in Infinity War and Endgame. And that is who he has become, like... The, calling this the Falcon and the Winter Soldier was a really cool idea because he is still dealing with the baggage of the Winter Soldier and he has called the Winter Soldier multiple times and there's that, that moment in uh, Madripoor where uh, Baron Zemo like kind of messes with his head and he does some very Winter Soldier type stuff. I don't think he's about that though. I don't think he liked doing that. I don't think that's who he is anymore. Uh, and I hope season two reflects that. Like, maybe maybe it will be called Captain America and the White Wolf. Maybe season three will be called Captain America and the White Wolf. And that season two will address this complaint and make him more of the central focus. As it stands, though, he, he kind of fell lost in the shuffle a little bit. Uh, John Walker, Carly Morgenthau, and to a lesser extent, Zemo had, had a lot more, you know, impact on, on this plot than he did. What else is there to say about the Falcon? Uh, Anthony Mackie knocked it out of the park and this is this is a guy who is really smart honestly i've i've seen a lot of interviews with him now and he knows his shit like he knows captain america uh i saw a tweet of him uh earlier today that it was a tweet or a facebook post maybe from like 2014 that was like there's finally a black captain america it was him basically reacting to uh sam getting the shield in the comics and it was a picture of him as a kid as Captain America. And it was that on one side and then him in this final episode on the other side. He he earned it. He, he earned it in this. It's one of those things where the show is good. And it is good because he worked for the S.H.I.E.L.D. And also he went on an arc to get the S.H.I.E.L.D. Like he was not really worthy of the S.H.I.E.L.D. at the start of this show. He was too compromising, he was too wishy-washy, he was too... He was the Falcon, though, at the end of the day. And there's nothing wrong with him being the Falcon. Uh, and this whole show, he steps up, and this is reflected with his relationship with his sister and his town, and how he his compromising nature doesn't... It works a lot of times, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes he has to, like, grow a spine. Like, it, it's by the end of it he does take the mantle and he does earn it and he and he rocks it too i started this podcast type video complaining about the way he looked in the comics a lot of those complaints are not present here uh namely because he doesn't use the shield a whole lot and he very rarely uses the shield in tandem with the wingsuit like he uses it in tandem with like the jetpack part of the wingsuit but it's really like he does a lot of the Falcon type stuff. He's just called Captain America and then he'll break out the shield anytime he's he's fighting on the ground. It, it makes him a much more diverse fighter that, that he switches back and forth the way he does. And it looks a lot better than it does in the comics. Though it still does look a little goofy. You know, I, I don't think there's a way to really make uh, that work. Um, again, I, I really think uh, 
Bucky would have looked better with the shield, but he doesn't need it as much. You know, he's got the vibranium arm now. But I like that he he does fall in this this sweet spot between, you know, he doesn't listen to Isaiah Bradley. He doesn't let Isaiah Bradley mess with his head for very long. He, he agrees that the government has the option to not make the same mistakes that they made before and that they do have the option to make things a better place, but he does also call Carly out on her bullshit a lot, which is fine. I I think he doesn't do it enough, but I think that's because the series really wants us to empathize with Carly, even though she's an insufferable twat, and also a murderer. Like, that, that, you know, that that doesn't help. He kicks a lot of ass. I, I, I love the way that they utilize the wingsuit here. Uh... Yeah, it makes me glad that they switched to the more mechanical wings in the comics. Uh, it, it looks a lot less goofy than if they were, like, the feathery wings and he was doing all this stuff. Also, apparently, like, this suit is made out of vibranium. I don't recall it being vibranium in the comics. Uh, I will have to look that up. Uh, or you can just tell me in the comments below. But yeah, at the end of the day, uh, he really holds a lot of this stuff together. He really keeps things moving along, and he, he it, it works. You know, th th there's a couple hiccups, particularly with the Flag Smasher stuff, but Anthony Mackey as Sam Wilson, he, he really does make it all work at the end of the day, which is why I decided to do this. And he's not my favorite part of the series, but he is really good, and he's the most important part, and the fact that he is as good as he is is the most important thing that the show could have gotten right. This is better than the equivalent storylines in the comics by a significant margin. And honestly, that's kind of par for the course for the MCU. I think Captain America the Winter Soldier movie was better than the Winter Soldier comics. I think the Civil War movie was better than the Civil War comics. And this was much better than uh, the Captain America comics with Sam Wilson taking over the shield. Uh, I, I can't remember if that ever had a had a, a, a kitschy name for that arc or not. So I give this show, it's a solid 8 out of 10. Yeah, like I had my problems, but it's, it's a really solid show that y'all should check out, especially if you're Captain America fans. Like, it, there's a lot of food for thought here that I didn't even really get into. And some that I probably got into a little too much. Uh, but I've been recording for well over an hour now. Yeah, I'm going to call it a day here for now. If you like what you've seen here and you want to see more, like, comment, and subscribe. Hit that bell icon. Consider supporting my Patreon. Join the Discord. And stay tuned for more stuff. I uh, With my job, this style of video that doesn't require a whole lot of editing, just recording and going through audio this might be the go-to format for my channel going forward so long as i so long as i'm working full time i'm mediocrity 4 thanks for watching